بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونشكره ولا نكفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم ما بعد يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون ويقول سبحانه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون ويقول سبحانه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما الحمد لله that we are here still alive and still have an opportunity to do something with our lives something better something more and one thing that is important to have is to always have an ambition to be an ambitious person to improve yourself to want more not less it just depends on f- what do you want more of right so alhamdulillah every day is a new opportunity every day represents our entire life from beginning to end from death to life to death death means your soul is not joined with your body it doesn't mean you don't exist according to the language of the quran before we came to this world we were souls which means we were dead but we were souls then we came to life which means our soul joined our body and now you are a human being full human and then from here your joy your soul will leave you so then you become what dead again then your soul will join you and you will become alive and human again this is very important to know why because sometimes philosophy gets to us and we say you know we are spiritual people in akhirah we will just be spirits and we will be souls and that's not the quranic point of view that's not the truth that allah revealed to us in the quran for you to be a human you have to have body and soul if it was more honorable for you to have a soul without a body then after resurrection when you enter jannah you will enter only as a soul and that's not what allah said so you need a body to be a human a full human an honorable human and our faith promotes this understanding that your body is important just like your soul is important so for you to say i you know i don't like my body i just want to be a spiritual person that's not islamic philosophy that is driven from quran from the traditions of our prophet the example that we have so we have to embrace ourselves as body and soul in jannah allah satisfies your body just like he satisfies your soul in jannah there is food in jannah there is drink in jannah there is things that totally appeal to the body and to the human nafs to the human nafs in jannah you get companions in jannah you get to wish whatever you want and allah talks about birds meat and fish and fruits and allah says it's similar for the lack of because you, you don't know it's a whole different realm of time and space so similar but it's not the same similar but not the same so that's why it's very important 
to know how to deal with your body. It's very important to know how to deal with your nafs, with your desires, and with your wants. And it's very important to reach that balance in which your body is playing its role, your nafs is playing its role, your heart is playing its role. And heart here, we mean emotional heart. In the Quran, Allah names it fuad. And then your deep consciousness, which is qalb, Allah names it qalb. Deep consciousness is qalb. In Arabic, in Urdu, in Persian, you say qalb, you mean your emotions, right? This is the modern Arabic. The old Arabic, qalb means your deep consciousness, your deep understanding, your deep aql. So, you have a body, you have a nafs, you have a fuad, you have a qalb, you have a aql, your mind. You have a deep secret. This part of you is something called the deep secret, sir. And then you have a soul. So there is seven of you in you. That's why you are so complicated and sophisticated. And that's why good luck trying to guide yourself without a divine revelation. That's what the human wants. So the human start manufacturing like exercise, exercise. Ex does the body need exercise? It does. Does it need to eat healthy? It does. There is no argument about that. Why argue? It doesn't make you more righteous if you don't take care of your body. It just doesn't. And it's not the sunnah of our prophet not to take care of your body. But if you satisfy your body and you eat the healthiest and you exercise and you become an athlete and a world famous athlete, does that mean that you're going to live a happy, peaceful, purposeful life? No. Because life shows us. I don't have to teach you. The Quran doesn't have to teach you. We have many examples of people who attain the peak of athleticism. Most possible thing that a human, and the next thing you know, they just were so happy that they had to take their life away. Bye. Nafs, desires and wants. There's needs and there's wants. And that's how your nafs functions. It tells you what your needs are and what your wants are. And your nafs is very skillful. It turns a need into a want. And it turns a want into a need. You want a 70 inch TV. My generation, we call it flat screen TV because the new generation have never seen a pregnant TV before. So we call it flat screen TV. So whenever you look, you want 70 inch screen. That's a want. Your nafs keep on nagging and you are nagging and you are nagging you and making a want, what? A need. It's not a need, it's a want. But your nafs is very skillful in doing that. You have a need. You need to eat. True or false? True. And stay with me and answer me so that you stay awake. Right? Inshallah. Because the lighting, I think they made it uh, low lighting. If we can even put some more lights, I'll be very happy. If you have a control so that people don't go to sleep. Right? Many people tell me, my voice is so relaxing, it puts them to sleep, right? I don't want to put you to sleep, inshallah. <clears throat> Actually, one of my teachers, the, one of my dearest teachers, used to fall asleep when I talk. So, and he had a hard time falling asleep. So he would bring me and he would say, talk, talk. And he would asleep. <laughs> I was glad to be of service, alhamdulillah. So when you look at that, you need to eat, correct? True or false? Very true. But do you need to eat a lot? That's when your nafs turns a need into a want. Some people exert an amazing willpower. They are in control of their nafs and they don't have to be Muslim. When it comes to diet, it's like they have no nafs. They'll eat exactly the same amount, the right amount, every day. Every week, every month, every year. And you're like, do you not, do you ever not gain weight for God's sake? Like, are you a human or something? Like, why can't you gain weight like the rest of us, right? But being in control of your nafs, does that satisfy the all of you? Does that put all of you in peace? No, that's tackling one part of you. Dealing with the what? With the willpower in your nafs. 
Then you have emotions. And these emotions, we human beings, to make a long story short, we rely on two emotions. One is respect, and two is love. To us, this is the food of your emotions. If a human being is not loved and respected to a certain level every day, that human will not function right that day. So, what happens to children who are born and raised in such a reality, harsh reality, that they're not getting love or respect on a daily basis? Do you expect them to grow to, to be a normal human being? No. Is it their fault? No. Allahu A'lam, how long it will take them for one day to discover what they have been subjected to? Because all what they have heard, even from their mom and their dad, that's if they have the pleasure of knowing who's their mom and dad, was disrespectful. And no, no, they trust nobody and nobody trusts them. And they grow up in such an environment. My heart bleeds for such a situation. And then we come sometimes and judge these people not knowing what they went through. And if you actually know, by Allah, you will cry for a month to realize that there is a human that grew up not knowing love and respect on daily basis. Wallahi, that's worse than torture. That's worse than torture. So we need love and respect. طيب. We need love and respect, and we need to love and respect. It's something that we need to have on daily basis. It's normal. So now, from there, we go on, and we move on in our life. But let's say someone got love and respect. They got loved by their loved ones, right? They dreamt of marrying somebody. They married them, and they love them, and they love their partner. Is that enough to make their entire life happy and at peace? No. Then you have a deep, you have a mind, and the mind needs feed. So we need what? To feed in. And the mind uses the five senses. Your eyes, your ears, nose, touching, smelling, tasting, the whole thing. But most important for knowledge processing is your ears and your eyes. So the mind takes that, processes it, and then that's the function of the mind. It makes out of it. If it's good, the mind has an operating system. Part of this operating system is given to it by Allah. You're born with it. You don't have to learn it. Part of the operating system is both. My proof is when Allah said in Surah Al-Shams, وَنَفْسِمْ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Allah said, and by the nafs and the one who formed it, and by the one who inspired to the nafs, what is right and what is wrong? What is good and what is bad? What is evil and what is good, right? So all human beings share a certain level of knowing what is right from what is wrong. True or false? True. Otherwise, we will not be human. Imagine someone is born thinking killing babies is okay. And the other believes killing babies is the most horrific crime in the world. Would these two humans live together? Life will become impossible. Yet, in the world of lions, when a new lion comes, first thing he does, he fights the old lion, the alpha lion. He either kills him or he makes him run away. And the first item on the list is to kill the babies of the old lion. One by one, so that they don't grow up to be rival to him. For three days, the lionesses mourn the death of their children. After three days, they forget, and they go back into heat, and they mate, and they deliver new babies, and life goes on. So Allah shows you that I could have created you different, with a completely different set of common sense. But all human beings share the idea that killing is wrong, murder is wrong, lying is wrong. You don't need a religion, you don't need, because you were born with it. This is what we call fitra. Fitra, your inner instinct, your basic, God-given, endowed, basic, minimum, a human nature. So part of your mind knows how to function, knowing between right and wrong. But that's not enough. It needs more, and that's where the revelation comes. Right? 
Revelation comes to complement your mind, not to replace it. Not to put, it, put an X on it. But to complement it and empower it and give it what it can never reach on its own. That's the job of the what? Of the revelation. Otherwise, Allah didn't say in the Quran, I created you dumb knowing nothing about nothing your whole life. No. Allah said you were born knowing nothing. Then he taught you. Then you know. And now you know. Some of what you know is inherent in you, inherent in you, and some of it you learn it. طيب. Some people have an amazing intellectual power. You hear of these people who can multiply in numbers, 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 numbers. I saw a program, a guy who can calculate the pi. He reached to around 2,000 numbers, like all from his head. And it's a very difficult to calculate the next pi. You know, it's a mathematical number. <coughs> Or you give them six numbers times six numbers, they can calculate. You hear these people who are very smart in school, with PhDs, or doctors, or this, or this, or that. To have a smart mind, an active mind, an amazing mind, does that make the human happy for his entire life and peaceful? The answer is no. That's not enough. Hmm? And likewise, you have a soul. And the soul has its own food. The food of the soul is talking and connecting with Allah. How many meals do we eat every day? Be honest. <laughs> uh -huh. Now the honesty starts. Some four, five. Breakfast, snack. Lunch, snack. Dinner, snack. And then the midnight other day is not calculated. Anyway, you're half asleep anyway, right? You sleepwalk to the fridge, you eat and come out, and you don't even know what you ate, right? <sighs> Just like your body needs to eat five to six times a day, your soul needs to eat five to six times a day. And that's why, why are you surprised that we pray five times a day? And each meal is five to six to se seven minutes. Wudu and salah alone by yourself is a five minute process. If you want to add to it sunnah, ten minutes process. Distributed not at once, but during the whole day. So why are you surprised? So that is the food of your soul. What happens when someone doesn't feed their soul? Their soul starts screaming at them. But the soul doesn't have a voice like this voice. The soul shows you, you wake up in the morning depressed and you don't know why. Because you're not eating. When you don't eat, what do you feel? Hungry. When you don't pray, what do you feel? Hungry, but in a different way. So that's why it's what? It's we pray five times a day. This Islam, when you look at all the ibadat and all of its teachings in a very complicated, calculated, sophisticated way, it is doing, giving everything part of you, it's food, and it's what? And it's the, the, the nurture, the, the nutrition that you need. Together, when you put all the teachings of Islam together, then you can feel what? You feel that feeling that we're all chasing, the peace, the tranquility, the sometimes what we call happiness, the relaxation, the meaningful life, the purposeful life, the productive life, the progressive life, this doesn't happen by applying one thing and saying, I am spiritual. You can feed your soul, but if you're not feeding your body and mind and heart and every other part of you, your deep consciousness where all of your solid values are, settles, right? That's where your deep consciousness, that's where your deep calculator do I do this or do I do that? It's all the value, right? When it comes to your wedding night, your qalb shows up. I'm not talking fuad, I'm not talking about emotions. Your qalb. What kind of a wedding do you want? Your deep, settled core pops up. And you can either have a wedding that pleases Allah and makes the believers happy and everyone goes to it have a blast, or you have a wedding that this pleases Allah, and everybody walks and saying, huh, the flowers were cheap, oh, the food was not good, 
oh, it was not cooked right, and you spend north of $50 a plate, and still they're not happy. Because something was not done right, something was not the intention. So where does your deep core pops out with major decisions? It doesn't pop out every day just like that for small stuff. Small stuff, this makes the calculation, your aql. Deep stuff, big decisions, here. One of the MSA students came to me and said, you know, I am, like, I'm shocked. For you, my mother raised me, Islam, Allah, Islam, Allah, Islam, 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 until I reached to high school. And then the message was, if you don't pray, it's okay. Allah will forgive you. If you don't do it, Allah will forgive you. What's most what's important right now thing in your life is your grades. The girl, her mother raised her so well that by high school, she's solid Muslim. So <laughs> she made her daughter better than her. So good for her, right? Alhamdulillah. Let's look at the positive side. So the girl is in a state of shock that in the deep calculations of the mother, grades are more important than salah. You can let go of salah and Allah will forgive you. When does that, that's what's in your qalb, what has settled in your heart, that's the accumulation of years of convictions and things that go in your heart. Then there is your sir, and your sir is your deepest motive in life. And may Allah Azza wa Jal enable us one day to discover our own secret because you could not know your own secret so what is secret sir sir is what you know but the others don't know you know something you know about yourself or you know about someone else but the other doesn't know this is called in arabic sir but what is more hidden than sir allah says ya'lamu sirra wa akhfa he knows the sir and what is more hidden than the sir you know what's the sir? What's akhfa? Akhfa is what you don't know about you. But it's part of you. It's your deepest motive. Why do you do what you do? And that's your journey as an adult. Over the years, if you've been hearing everyone around you saying, what are people going to say about us? What are people going to say about us? How are we going to do this? What are people are going to say about us? What are people going to say about us? And you heard that over a thousand times. How many times did you hear, and what is Allah going to say about us? Zero. So when you grow up, what's your akhfa? What's your most hidden? What's your akhfa? What's your motive? Deepest motive in life, what is it? Allah or people? people and you spend your life thinking of yourself you're sincere but in reality you have not reached your the deepest what is hidden from you as they say there is that which you know and you know that you know are you a doctor here you're not you know you're not a doctor right so what are, where are you, high school, college? Where? What year? Third year, which country? MashaAllah. So he knows, he's in which year, he knows what he knows. And he knows what he doesn't know. But the third thing that is our blind spot is what we don't know that we don't know. And that's what your deepest secret, what is deeper than a secret. Sir is a secret, you know, but the others don't know. But akhfa is what you don't know, and you don't know that you don't know. Did I twist your mind? <laughs> Process it a little bit. I'll give you f five seconds. <clears throat> so that's why the teaching of Ramadan and the coming of the month of Ramadan is very, very, very crucial and important. And that's why the journey of being a believer is the most amazing journey one can ever take in their life. It's the most adventurous journey. It's the most um, 
exploring journey that you can take in your life. It's so much full of surprises and ups and downs. It's the most hard terrain that you can ever hike. That's yourself. The hike that you take inside you. We have a woman in our history called Rabi al Adawiya. Rabi al Adawiya started her life as what? As a woman that was known for doing things that are not halal. Let's leave it at that. Then people started bidding when one righteous man, Al Junaid, and they said, if Rabia shows up to Al Junaid, Al Junaid will not handle it. She's so beautiful. So she showed up to him and offered him herself. So he looked and he said, How beautiful of a body. And what a loss that such a body will end up in hell. So he shocked her. This is the first time someone said no to her. She attacked him, basically. She showed him herself. He said, right. So she cried and ran away. These stories. So then she became righteous. What she did not know about herself is that deep inside she is a righteous woman. But from outside she was raised by an evil environment. So she ended up taking that path. So Al Junaid awoke in that thing inside her. This story is prescribed to different ladies. So, but what we know about Rabia is she became one of the most amazing people in, in, the, in the world of, you know, taking a journey to Allah. And she said something, that's why I'm mentioning it. She said, I am amazed at people. Why are you amazed, Rabia al Adawiya? She said, people are willing to take a six months trip on feet, on foot, to go to Hajj and six months feet, uh, trip on foot to come back from Hajj. But they're not willing to take a trip that is that big. This is in Arabic, from this tip to this tip, when you open your hand, it's called Shibr. In the Hadith, it's mentioned in this. So you go, you don't have a measuring tape, so you go one, two, three, so you go one, two, this is Shibr, right? So she said, I'm amazed, people will travel six months on foot, for Hajj and six months coming back, but they will not take a trip this shibr. And they're like, what are you talking about? She says, I'm talking about that people will not take a trip from here to here. From here to discover themselves and what's deep and to change it and to make it a better person. And when you start diving deep, you're going to be disappointed in the beginning. And if that disappointment is going to make you depressed and deter you from continuing the journey, then you got the wrong lesson. But if that disappointment turns into, I am mad, I want to become better, I want to become the best, you're going to overcome. And the best of things, the best of all, Allah will help you to overcome. And if Allah is with you, who can be against you? And if Allah is against you, who can be with you? That's why every rak'ah we say, Ya Allah, Iya kana abudu. We worship you, Ya Allah, but even in worshiping you, sorry, Ya Allah, sorry, you know us, you created us. You created us to worship you, but even in worshiping you, we need your help. So please, Ya Allah, help us. Help us reach our maximum potential as human beings. May help us reach our, the best that we can ever be. Open our minds to the truth. Open our hearts. Help us reach the maximum that we can be. Don't, let, don't make us be happy with who we are and happy with ourselves and happy where we are in our faith. Help us to desire more and to worship you more. You know, imagine... Rasulullah takes this iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'een and makes a dua out of it. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. That's when you finish your salah. Dua. You know. Allahu Akbar, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Allahumma anta as-salam wa minka as-salam. Tabarakta wa ta'alayta ya dhal jalali wa l-ikram. Next dua. Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Ya Allah, help me so that I will remember you 
and so that I will thank you wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik that my ibadah will be hasan excellent help me to get do an excellent worship isn't that interesting your allah creates you to worship him then you say can you please help me <laughs> when that's your job but allah says i will help you that's why this journey of faith this journey from here to here the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's easy for those whom allah made it easy for them and it's hard for those who don't seek allah's help so why am i always excited about ramadan because this is the chance that you my god it's like you know fireworks on 4th of july that's what ramadan is for a believer it's fireworks and every explosion is a different beauty and different colors and different it's like going to a garden right going to a garden full of flowers and every time you run to another flower oh my god ramadan oh my god salat at tarawih oh my god reading quran oh my god dhikr oh my god dua oh my god this oh my god feeding the poor oh my god it's like oh my god the whole time you're like and every flower is more you, you, you like you almost can't focus and that's the beauty of ramadan if Ramadan does not excite you, then nothing is going to excite you. And that's why we say something interesting about Ramadan. Because Ramadan is a blessed month, chosen month by Allah. And let me tell you about when something is chosen. Allah tells us in the Quran three examples. Allah chose amongst people, prophets and messengers, and even average people. Allah chooses amongst them. May Allah choose us. Say Ameen. Luqman. Prophet or not a prophet? Not a prophet. Yet there is a surah in his name in the Quran. The seven youth of the cave. Seven, eight, six, five, whatever, right? Prophets or not prophets? Not a prophet. Surah dedicated to them. Surah Yasin. Allah sends two messengers. Support them with a third one. They're not the focus of the story. Who ends up being the focus of the story? The believer who came from the farthest part of the city and believed, he becomes the hero. And he's the celebrate. What happened to the three messengers? Yeah, there are three messengers, but here is the hero. Right? Do you have to be a prophet? You don't have to be a prophet or a messenger. But the door is still open for you to be what? To be chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, something very simple about Allah. If you are excited about Allah, Allah is royal. Allah will not force himself onto you. That's why he gave you the freedom of what? Choice. And that's why you're not an angel. Allah created angels in a way. Do angels eat? Do they drink? So is there fasting for them? No, there's no fasting. Do angels sleep? So is there Qiyamul Layl for them? There's no Qiyamul Layl. Do angels get married and have children? So there's no spouse bothering them. <laughs> or children bugging them. You this sacrifice your whole life for a child? Only, what's your reward? Get away from me. <laughs> Woo! 18 years, that's the reward. Get away from me. You're bothering me. Leave me alone. You know what happened if I left you alone when you were a day old or a month old or a year old? You wouldn't live to say this. Leave you alone? So do angels go through that struggle? They don't. And that's why sometimes we get so stuck in our world. I just sometimes wonder, what does the name Ar-Razzaq means to an angel who doesn't need to eat or drink? It has to mean completely something else, different. What does the, main, the name Al-Ghafoor, Al-Ghaffar, and Ghafir, and At-Tawwab mean to an angel that doesn't sin? It has to be a whole different world. Subhanallah. So, an angel that doesn't have a desire, 
that doesn't have a lust, that doesn't have needs, that doesn't have wants. Allah, if he wished, he would have created you like that. So stop wishing being an angel. And stop saying, I am not an angel. As our youth say, da. Yeah, of course you're not an angel. Right? Stop wishing being an angel, because you're not an angel. And you were not meant to be one. Stop keeping shaitan, stop believing the lies of shaitan, that because you have a desire, you're evil. That because you have a lust, you're evil. That's not what Allah said. Allah said, I give you the desire, I give you the lust. I'm just asking you to fulfill it in an honorable way because you're an honorable creation of mine. I never told you don't fulfill your desire. I told you fulfill it just in an honorable way. So you see how shaitan twists the word in your head. That's why it's important that in Ramadan, Allah Azza wa Jal, in one hadith, he chains the masters and the leaders of shayateen. And in another hadith, he ma chains the shayateen to give you a break. But this is something very important for us to wake up to and to realize. So, brothers and sisters, whenever we talk about Ramadan, we're talking about us embracing our maximum potential. Like here comes the boot camp, the campaign, the crash course that's going to make the best out of you. And if you actually understand the depth of Ramadan from all angles, because you, know, you have to be patient with yourself, it's not good that you learn everything at once. Your mind cannot process it. So my goal today is not to just knowledge, knowledge, dump on you, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Because what's that going to do? It's not going to change you. But if you can walk away today with one thing, one goal, one thing that you can change about yourself, then you have won. If you walk away with, wow, that was a nice speaker, and he was amazing, and he was kept our, at, did you come here to say something nice about someone else? And then you walk away, and that was a nice speech, and then it all turns to be entertainment, and there's no change. This talk that I'm talking with you, Allah said, this is a serious talk. It's not for, it's not for mockery and joking. And then Allah Azza wa Jal tells us it's a serious, it's a life-changing talk that is not supposed to be taken for entertainment. So, as they say, tighten your belt, get excited, know that everything in you needs Ramadan, from your body, to your nafs, to your fuad, to your qalb, to your aql, to your khafa, to your ruh. It all interacts with Ramadan and it eats and it takes something from Ramadan. And it restores your humanity to you. And restoring your humanity is a big project. Because Allah in the Quran told us, I have honored the children of Adam. I have made, carried their descendants in the land and in the sea. I have given them of all good things. And I have preferred them over a great portion of my creation. And only Allah knows how much he created. Allah told us in the Quran, I create things that I don't tell you about. People today are so happy. Oh my God, we discovered there is new theory in physics. What is it? The multiverse. What is that? So universe is uni means one. But now we're talking about like this whole huge universe could be just one bubble. And there is another universe, another universe, another universe, another. We're like, really? They're like that. I said, like, oh, come on, people, you better come up with something more exciting. Why? Because that's at the end of Surah Yasin. Really? Yes. Allah says, أَوَلَيْسَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِقَادِرٍ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَخْلُقَ مِثْلَهُمْ بَلَىٰ وَهُوَ الْخَلَّاقُ الْعَلِيمُ Isn't he who created the skies and the earth is capable of creating the like of them? Yes, he did. And he will. بَلَىٰ 
وهو الخلاق العليم خالق means creator خلاق is the exaggeration of the word خالق in Arabic which means the one who creates again and again and again and again and again and again بلا وهو الخلاق العليم then Allah says and do you know why is that so easy for me and Allah says, and we say why he says إنما أمره إذا أراد شيئا أن يقول له كن فيكون when he desires something, he says to it, be and says, so to you, it's a sophisticated thing. Oh my God, it's a huge universe. To Allah is nothing more than a command. Command to exist, command to maintain, command to vanish, to end it. It's all commands. No request, no please, no asking, just command. Be and it is. And after it is, Allah says, وَلَا يَؤُدُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا Allah is not tired by keeping the skies and the earth. That's in your, on your level. But on Allah's level, this is nothing. You understand? So that's why we are very excited about Ramadan. Allah chose amongst people. إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَى نُوحًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَى آدَمَ وَنُوحًا وَآلَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَآلَ عِمْرَانَ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ Allah has chosen Adam, Nuh, Ali Ibrahim, and Ali Imran over the rest of mankind. Interestingly, Adam individual, Nuh individual, when it came to Ibrahim and Imran, Allah mentioned them and their family. So that's a goal that you want to have. You and your family be chosen. Al. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammad. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala your family. You want honor for your family too. Spread the honor, share the honor, right? And be smart about how you want to do that. <clears throat> so Allah in Allah Astafa. Angels are talking to Maryam alayhi salam. ya Maryamu. Hold and lo and behold, when the angels said, O oh Maryam, in Allah Astafaki, Allah has chosen you. Watahharaki, and he has purified you. وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ And he has chosen you above the women of all mankind. No woman had a baby without a father except Maryam. End of the story. Chosen or not chosen? But what you see in all of this, Adam, Nuh, Ibrahim, and Ali Imran, and Maryam, they all paid the price. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he paid the price meaning he wanted to be chosen after really spending lots of time and reading lots of books about the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, I have come up with one sentence that I can summarize the whole thing this man وسلم, chose to be chosen and if you don't get that, you will never be able to follow his sunnah. Because you will always think of him as someone, Allah chose him, khalas. No, no, no. This man chose to be chosen. Who goes to a cave for five years, back and forth, back and forth? You go to a cave five hours and you come back bragging on it. <laughs> five days and you're like camper. Like five weeks and you're like, whoa, guru. Right? Five months and like, where did you go? Nobody goes back and forth and leaves his life. This man paid the price. His entire life, he was keen into doing the right thing and being chosen. And he did, and he did, and he did, and he did. And finally he said, Ya Allah, I just want you to talk to me. Just talk to me, please. And if Jibreel didn't come at the end of the five years, when he was 40 years old, the Prophet would have stayed another five years until Jibreel came and talked to him. He would have not given up. You understand? طيب. Allah chose him. When Allah chooses a person, Allah makes that person blessed. Allah makes that person blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? It means to have a value above any other value, extra and above average. Good value. <coughs> So Allah Azza wa Jal tells us that Isa alayhi salam is giving a speech as an infant in his mother womb, in his mother hand, infant. He says, 
قال إني عبد الله آتاني الكتاب وجعلني نبيا وجعلني مباركا أينما كنت أن الله made me blessed wherever I go wherever I am I am blessed translation سيدنا عيسى عليه السلام he used to go from little food he used to feed the masses bless value extra value extra good value and this blessing in something يعني الله عز وجل will suspend or overactivate the rules of cause and effect what are the rules of cause and effect like i become a doctor doctors are paid half a million dollar a year i become a doctor i end up making half a billion dollar a year this is extra what value above and beyond the world of cause and effect you understand so blessing this is in terms of money sometimes a person doesn't have a a lot of money but they have a blessing wherever they go they solve the problem allah give them a talent a baraka no matter what the problem they can sit down they can solve the problem so that's why this to be chosen and to be blessed go hand in hand so please notice with me what al what what we do every salah allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ala كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى what's the next one وبارك you see the بركة very important على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما بارك you see are you with me okay so very good so now having said that second Allah chose from amongst places places what is the place a place like who can give me a place that has been chosen by Allah? <laughs> Someone said Medina before Mecca. You're biased. <laughs> okay. Allah Azza wa Jal says, which was the first house that was built for Allah so that people can worship Allah in it? Which one? Mecca, the Kaaba. Inna awwala baytin wudi'a lil nasi lalladhi bi bakkata Mubarakan wahudan lil alameen. When Allah chooses a place, that place becomes Mubarak. Tayyib. What's Mubarak? What's Baraka? Extra value. So you go to Mecca, you pray one rak'ah, 100,000. No more cause and effect. Above and beyond. Extra value. This idea of extra value is so attractive to us that Walmart and Macy's adapted it. Big sale, extra value. Value, you receive what in the mail? Value pack. Do you know the value pack that you never use? You feel sad that the, they cut the trees to make such a thing? Anyway. When it comes to Ramadan, the Prophet wasallam used to tell his ashab, just so that you understand the similarity when Allah chooses something. No more cause and effect. Even ten for one is no more cause and effect. When Allah chooses something, it becomes blessed. So you used to say this, Rasulullah Atakum Ramadan. Here comes to you the month of Ramadan. Like this is around Rajab Sha'ban. Shahru Barakah. What did Rasulullah call Ramadan? Shahru a month of extra, extra, extra value. Tayyib, what happens, Ya Rasulullah, in the month of Ramadan? One of the most fascinating hadith. يَغْشَاكُمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِيهِ Allah Azza wa Jal makes himself present amongst you on that month. How, where, when? Don't ask. Just Allah makes himself present amongst you on that month. So what does he do? فَيُنزِلُ الرَّحْمَةِ So Allah brings rahma with him. وَيَحُطُّ الْخَطَايَا And Allah forgives the sins. وَيَسْتَجِيبُ فِيهِ الدُّعَاءِ And Allah answers the dua in it. وَيَنظُرُ اللَّهُ إِلَى تَنَافُسِكُمْ فِيهِ Allah sees your competition in worshipping him in this month. Allah looks 
and sees, and he's all knowing, all hearing, all seeing, sees your competition in worshipping him that month, فَيُبَاهِي بِكُمْ مَلَائِكَتَهِ Allah takes pride in us in front of his angels. So Allah tells the angels, look, 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 look. You don't need to sleep. That's why I mentioned it. You need, do not need to sleep. These, if they don't sleep, they can't survive. Yet they leave their sleep to worship me. You don't need to eat. I created you with no need for eating. These need eating. And they're not eating for me. You don't need to drink. They need to drink. And they're leaving their drink next to you. You don't need to mate. They need to mate. And they're leaving their mating. Even in halal, husband and wife, they leave it for me. I take pride in my ibad in front of my angels. The Prophet mentioned that twice. In the month of Ramadan, and in the day of Arafah, in Hajj, that Allah takes pride in his ibad in front of his angels. So, Allah did not create you an angel, so stop crying and embrace, embrace the value that Allah has given you, the barakah as a human, because at the end of the day, Allah told us in the Quran that Allah told Adam to bow down to the angels. True? No. That's a test. For you awake or asleep. Allah ordered the angels to bow down to Adam alayhi salam. Not the other way around. And you and I, we were in his line. The leon in the back. We were in his back, in his spine. When the angels made that sajda to him. We were all present in his spine, alayhi salam, when they made sajda to him. A sujood of respect, not a sujood of ibadah. I trust you know the difference. It's a respect. Can the son ever be better than his father and mother? In value? No, they brought him to life. But yet, Yaqub, his wife, the parents of Yusuf, and the 11 brothers make sujood to Yusuf. It doesn't make Yusuf better than his parents, but it makes Yusuf very special that his parents made sujood to him out of respect. Do you understand now? Because Allah mentions to us that they made sujood to him. And it was at that time, it was halal to make sujood of respect. But at the final version of Islam, Allah said, you don't make sujood to each other. Don't make sujood to each other because what? Because then people get confused and they start worshipping one another. So that's why, brothers and sisters, we need to what? discover the, what? the value. Atakum shahru Ramadan, shahru baraka. Yagshakum Allah ta'ala fi. Allah descends upon you. Fayunzilur rahma. He brings mercy with all the colors of mercy. It's not one color, it's colors. Types, different types, different kinds, different ways of Allah's mercy manifesting itself in your life. وَيَحُطُّ الْخَطَايَا And Allah forgives the sins. Because you made a choice. You see, an angel doesn't sin, you sin. But an angel doesn't have a choice, you have a choice. And if you choose Allah, it makes you special and different. وَيَسْتَجِيبُ فِيهِ الدُّعَاءَ And Allah answers the dua. And Allah looks at your competition in that month. So he takes pride in you in front of his angels. And here is the final line, the punch line that gets me excited and should get you excited. The Prophet said, فَأَرُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ خَيْرًا Show Allah some goodness of yourself. You want to show off? Show off to Allah. Don't show off to people. Do you know what we call show off to people? What do we call that? Show off. Riya. Do you know what we call show off to Allah? Ikhlas. It's the same thing. It's the same thing in you. You can use it to impress people. And look, 
there's a psychology to this show off. The more the person is special, the more you want to show up to them. Right? The more the person is special, the more you want to show up. The more the person is knowledgeable, like do you want to show off to a sixth grade or do you want to show off to a PhD? PhD, naturally. Do you want to show off to the guy who opens the door and closes it? Or do you want to show off to the president? To the president. The higher the position, the more you want to show off. The more knowledgeable the person, the more they want to show off. The more unique and special and known is the person, the more you want to show off. So the question is, who's more knowledgeable than Allah? And who's more in control and in position and in power than Allah? And who's more unique than Allah? When he is one of a kind, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ So, this whole idea inside you that you want to show off, take it and direct it to Allah. What do we call show off to Allah? Ikhlas, sincerity. That's why Allah says, Surah Al-Ikhlas, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ اللَّهُ One unique, self-reliant. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ And again, to emphasize the meaning, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ no one is equal to him or like into him. Interestingly, if this fact settles in your head, now you're going to have energy to show off to Allah. That energy to show off to Allah, because Allah is unique, Ahad, and He's in control, and He's the Lord, and the King. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ ال... قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Who's Rabbi Nas? Allah. What's the next one? Do you like to show off in front of a king or in front of the guy who opens the door to the king? Of course, in front of the king. Interestingly, in Surah Qul Wallahu Ahad, the word Ikhlas is not there. It's the only surah, its name is not mentioned in it. Surah Al Falaq, in the Falaq. Surah Al Nas, in the Nas. Surah Al A'la, in the Nas. Surah Al Alaq, in the A'la. Only surah doesn't have the name in it, it's Surah Al Ikhlas. The name of the surah is what you're supposed to get out of the surah. Do you get it? So that's why in the month of Ramadan, we're supposed to what? To get in that energy of ikhlas. Because Allah is one and unique. And you are about to do something that is different. One of the things that I have, I never understood fasting until I traveled and in one of the colors of fasting, the depth of fasting, and how fasting makes you closer to Allah, it clicked with me. I was traveling around the world and in countries that have temples. And in these temples, there are idols. You're walking in the street, you look inside, you see the temple, it's open, you can see the idols. You don't even have to walk inside. One thing that kept on a, repeat, a repeating theme is in front of every idol, there is food. Type first time, okay. Type second time, no, every time, and in front of every idol, there is. So what clicked in my head, I said, Subhanak Ya Rabb. These people wanted you, but ended up going somewhere else. And what they are offering their God that they worship is food. But you don't need food. And you don't need drink. Allah says in the ayah, you know that every Muslim knows, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا So that they will worship me. I did not create the jinn and the ayah. Do you know what's the next ayah says? مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ I don't want them to give me income, rizq. وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَن يُطْعِمُونَ I don't want them to feed me. Because the Arab used to do the same thing. Slaughter a lamb and leave it in front of the idol and put the blood on the, on the idol. So Allah said, I don't want you to give me rizq. I don't want you to feed me. إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ What it occurred to me that in Islam, Subhanallah, this faith is from Allah. We don't offer Allah food. We offer Allah hunger. It's the opposite. We offer Allah 
the denial of our own need for a certain hours of eating and drinking to show Allah, Ya Allah, we can't offer you food, we can't offer you money, we can't offer you rizq, we can't offer you anything. All what we can offer you is that focus. All what could reach to you, all what, we, what you would appreciate from us is that focus that you are the one and only in our hearts. So what we offer you, what we show you, that Ya Allah, even our needs, food, drink, this, pleasure, we will suspend all of it so that we can focus on you. And that's really, really deep. Interesting that you offer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I found out that that's an ayah in the Quran. When you slaughter in Hajj, Allah said in the Quran, لَنْ يَنَالَ اللَّهُ لُحُومُهَا وَلَا دِمَاؤُهَا To Allah will not reach the flesh and the blood of what you're slaughtering. You're slaughtering in Hajj, you know, the day of Eid, they call it Yawm Al-Nahr. In, in Hajj, they don't call it the day of Eid. They call it the day of slaughter. There's the name of Eid. In Hajj, it's not called day of Eid. It's called Yawm Al-Nahr, the day of slaughter. You slaughter. So Allah said, when you slaughter, I just want you to know that to me will not reach the flesh and the blood. Who's going to eat the flesh? The fellow human, feed it to the poor. وَلَكِنْ يَنَالُهُ التَّقْوَى مِنْكُمْ what reaches to Allah is the taqwa from you. What is the taqwa? The total focus and consciousness and, 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 and devotion inside you and outside you in words, in intentions, and in actions. You are showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are focused. And that's what Allah appreciates. Does Allah need that? No, but He appreciates it. Does Allah need that? No. You have an 18 years old. Again, leave me alone. Don't talk to me. Can you stop nagging on me? This and that, right? If you say, you left them alone, you said, okay, you see that door? Open it and leave and don't come back. And they left. Can you breathe without them? Can, can you breathe? Or you need them in the room to breathe? Actually, you can breathe better now. Can you eat? Or no, actually you can eat better because they keep on emptying the fridge. They're like an eating machine at age 18, right? Can you sleep or no? You can actually sleep better. Because always their TV and their friends and they're talking midnight to their friends. You don't need them. But if they come back and kiss your hand, would you appreciate it? Of course. And that's why I believe one of the reasons Allah made us get married and have children is just to understand our relationship with him. If you just focus on that, you stop paying attention, all of the th people that, you know, they have problems with Allah, Ya Allah, why you did this to me? Just look at the relationship. Allah give you an example so that you can understand. And then we say, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى And to Allah belongs the highest example. Because at the end of the day, we human beings, when we grow older, we need our children to hold us, take us, host us, talk to us. Allah doesn't need at the end of the day. So it's just a temporary example that gives you some understanding. You take your child, two years old. He's running around, blabbing all the place, active, running. You, know, you take him to the doctor. Where are we going? Oh, we're to the doctor. The child doesn't know what's hitting him. You enter the doctor. The doctor comes wearing nice white coat and this. Looks like an angel. I have my mom and I have an angel in the room. Five minutes later, this angel walks in with four needles. Okay, what's going on here? Okay, are we okay here? Okay, maybe, maybe these are not needles. So then they start taking off your clothes and they start rubbing you with something cold and you taste the first needle and you scream. And now where do you run? To your mom. So your mom hugs you. And you're like, thank you, mom. And it turned to be she's only holding you for him to finish the other three needles. <laughs> Total betrayal. You lost faith in everything in life. Khalas. No angels, no this. And, and you start questioning why. And you grow up 
and then you say, thank you, mom, for doing that. The people who didn't get the vaccination died from the smallest virus, polio, or this or this or that. And you run to Allah, and Allah holds you and embraces you, and then he tests you. And now you're objecting. Why are you doing this to me? And if you just paid attention a little bit to what's going on in your life, Allah gives you an example of everything that happens with you, he gives you an example of it in real life. So, Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us to what? To awaken to this. So when we come to fasting, Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us, O oh, you who believe, fasting has been prescribed to you like it was prescribed to those who came for you, before you. More literal translation, O oh, you who believe, fasting has been written upon you like it was written upon those who came before you so that you may gain taqwa. Why do we need to gain taqwa? Because at the end of the day, the only thing you can offer Allah in your entire lifespan is taqwa. What's the only thing you can give? Is taqwa. So that's why, brothers and sisters, we really need to start thinking, okay, Ramadan is coming. And in Ramadan, Ramadan is a blessed month. And in Ramadan, we fast. And in fasting, we do what? We deny ourselves basic things to show that, Ya Allah, in this month, you are my number one focus with no number two in sight. You're my number. You are Ahad in my mind and heart and soul. You are Ahad and I will focus on you totally, Ya Allah. And that is what you are able to do what in Ramadan. So please, when we fast in Ramadan, don't turn yani, the day into fasting and the night, like fast all day, eat all night. Don't do that. Because you ruin it, right? Then you have offered nothing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, his diet year around is simple. In Ramadan, simpler. Year around his diet, humble. What do they call today, today, raw food diet for three months? Our mother Aisha said, from the crescent to the crescent to the crescent, yani two months to three months, we have not let a fire in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu to cook food. There is nothing to cook. Dates, milk, dates, milk, dates, milk, nothing to cook. Raw food diet, three months. Another three months, they will slaughter and eat meat. Another, they will cook something. So the Prophet's diet year round, low calorie diet, closer to raw food diet, closer to, you know, when you eat something, eat it like, you know, the Arab, the most sophisticated dish that the Arab had was the thareed. Thareed, you cook the meat in soup, in water. You make bread, you put the bread in the plate, you pour the soup on the bread, and then you put the meat on the top of the bread. So meat, bread, sogged with what? With soup. Thareed. Thareed. Fanciest dish. Subhanallah. And the Prophet ﷺ always asked us to, yani he, he advised, he said, if one of you cooks food, if one of you cooks food, let him or let her increase the water and let her or him feed his neighbors. The water brings more, gives soup. And subhanAllah, now we know soup is alkaline when meat is acidic. The soup full of minerals. The minerals makes the soup alkaline. The meat itself is what? Acidic. That's why they found out that reason number one in the world after plugging in 100,000 studies in the United Nation, reason number one is eating red meat again and again and again and again, and especially processed meat and especially burnt meat with barbecue. And the very interesting thing that I fall into hadith that the Prophet never ate a barbecue before. He always eat meat with the 
soup. That was what he liked. He did. It's not haram. It's not haram. But he, this is his liking. So, in Ramadan, you are dehydrated. What do you need? Soup. Soup and salad. Soup and salad. Soup and salad. Soup and salad. Make this your way in living you know, during the month of Ramadan. So, isn't it Adhan Maghrib now? Allahu Akbar, Allah. This is a perfect time to break, inshaAllah. May Allah Azza wa Jal benefit us from that which we learn and teach us that which benefit us. And may Allah Azza wa Jal make that which we learn change us from inside and from outside, inshaAllah. And inshaAllah we meet you after Salat al-Maghrib. Barakallahu feekum. And now we're back to our presentation. This presentation is, talks about five to six subjects. In order for you to fully understand Ramadan, you need to learn primarily about four subjects and then secondary about two subjects. The four subjects that form the matrix of Ramadan is number one, the Quran. Number two, fasting. Number three, guidance. And number four, taqwa. These are the four major subjects that form the matrix of Ramadan. Ramadan is like a matrix that you have to learn, understand, and figure out so that you know how to literally utilize the month. Utilize the month. Whether you are a man or a woman, whether you are on your period or not. You still have to know the full knowledge so that you can utilize the month. And that's something very important. Is there is a notion, if you're not fasting in the month of Ramadan, then you know there is nothing much to do. Just It's like a normal time, and that's not true. If you're breaking your fast because you're of old age, or young age, or sick, or pregnant, or breastfeeding, or on your period, or post-delivery, this does not mean that you are not going to come out of Ramadan as a winner and come out with a lot, not a little. So this is something that is very important for us to know. And inshallah, I'm you know, going to take you just into a quick journey of what could be a, a long presentation. But inshallah, um, it revolutionizes the understanding of Ramadan and it starts, you start seeing the whole thing in a whole different way. And the reason being is that not because I'm different or special or I'm unique or I'm talented or any of that. It's a very simple. It's because when you go back to the Quran itself and you just make it your base and you stop paying attention to word by word and you go back to the prophetic saying, Jazakallah khair. May Allah reward you. Azzakallah. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. See how lucky I am. Allah is very fiqh. Allah is khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman. So, going back to the Quran and to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu there is no more impressive words of a human more than the words of the Prophet Sallallahu And there is no impressive, more impressive word, period, than the word of Allah. And I mean it with the full meaning of the word impressive, miraculous, mind-blowing, eye-opening, heart-enlightening, mind-enlightening. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. And it's all between our hands. And then I find that people just keep on repeating a presentation that they heard from their teacher and they just keep on repeating the same thing without actually allowing themselves to go back to the sources and just not without inventing anything new. We have some people that they want to just completely leave the Quran and Hadith or another people that will completely want us just to read exactly what is in the books and not to add anything even if what we're adding is also from the Quran and Sunnah. So there is a way in the middle without being an inventor like a meaning an inventor of a whole new thing, or without forsaking the whole thing, there's a middle path. My anchor, my base, my enlightenment, 
came from this ayah, 185, chapter 2. Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah 185. You see it on the screen. شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ هُدَى لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِّنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرْ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ وَلِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ This ayah is like a sample from the whole Qur'an that if you read nothing about the Qur'an but this ayah, you can figure so many things about Islam in general, about the Qur'an in general, about the Prophet and the message and the messenger, just from this ayah. One ayah is enough to represent the Qur'an. And that's very impressive. So this Ramadan, Allah says, Shahru Ramadan. So I'm going to ask you a question. Let's do this social experiment and be honest, right? I want you to give me the first thing that comes to your mind. Not the right answer for the Shaykh. Not the sophisticated answer, not the complicated, just the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? When someone tells you in the last two months, when someone every year comes and tells you, hey man, Ramadan is coming, it's like not far from now, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Fasting. Hmm? First thing that comes to your mind. Ramadan is coming, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Fasting, right? Most of you said that. Right? Is blessing. Huh? One said, less sleep. True, yes? Iftar? Okay. <laughs> You're positive, mashallah. <laughs> you remember the good part, mashallah. Huh? Ah, someone says the special cookies of Ramadan. Here we have a nice, mashallah. Depends what culture you come from, depends on the dessert, right? Yes. Salat al taraweeh right? But I'm asking the first thing that comes to your mind. Ramadan is coming. Usually what comes? Fasting, right? So, I just ask myself, if we were at the time of the Prophet Wasallam, we will find out that Ramadan became part of the matrix of Islam, the teachings and the structure of Islam in the second year in Medina. And the first time Ramadan was introduced, it was optional. You either fast or feed a miskin. Third year, it became obligation. So, Muslims were Muslims for 13 years in Mecca, two years in Medina. And if I were to come and ask Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, Hadrat Aisha, uh, Khadija radiallahu anha you know one of these early believers Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib if I come and ask them this is the first 13 years Ramadan is coming are they going to think of nothing because there is no fasting yet right and there is no salat al taraweeh yet and there is no giving iftar to other person yet and there is nothing none of that what's in your head none of that would they say like oh, oh okay Okay, so what's the big deal? Or is there something special about the month of Ramadan that they would say? Exactly. Something happened in the past. And because of that thing that happened, you and I are here 1400 years later, sitting down in a place called a masjid, calling ourselves Muslims believing in Allah and in His Messenger, following the Qur'an, because something happened. That thing happened in the month of Ramadan. And that's where the story started. The birth of the Qur'an, yani the first revelation in Ramadan. The birth of the Prophet wasallam as a messenger in Ramadan. The birth of Islam in Ramadan. The birth of Muslims in Ramadan. The whole story in Ramadan. And that has to become very clear in your head before you ever think of anything else when it comes to Ramadan. 
Otherwise, you don't get it. Now, here is an interesting thing. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is asked, Ya Rasulullah, why do you fast on Mondays? He said, because that's a day that I was born in, and that's a day that I received the revelation in. So Rasulullah marked his physical birth and his prophetic messenger birth, spiritual birth. He marked both of them, celebrated them by doing what? So think for a second. When we want to celebrate a birthday, what do we do? Lots of food, lots of cakes, lots of calories. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to celebrate a birthday, his birthday, not once a year, once a week, what did he do? I wonder where did he get that from? And I have a suspicion that I have no proof of that he got that from that when he saw that Allah made the month that the revelation came in a month of fasting he took that and he made the day he was born in and the day he received the revelation in also a day of fasting because in this faith you don't celebrate with overeating and consuming you celebrate back again to what we said in the beginning by fasting and offering something in the name of Allah for the sake of Allah. So this is something that is very important for us to get. That the month of Ramadan is a blessed month independent of you and I fasting in it. We need a proof. And the proof The Prophet وسلم, said, When the first night of Ramadan comes, all the gates of heaven open until no gate is closed. Meaning, all good deeds are welcomed. Because the gates of heaven, that the door, the gate of charity, the, the gate of humbleness, the gate of fasting, the gate of Umrah and Hajj, any, the good deeds, every gate represents a good deed. So all good deeds are welcomed. And all gates are open. Now I'm just wondering, brothers and sisters, if we have our sensors, that ruh of us, polished, and the sensor is not covered with dust. Only Allah knows what you can feel when the gates of heaven opens and the wind start blowing. And when the gates of hell closes until no gate is open, so all of that heat is gone, and all of those blessings, all of this wind blowing, you only have to have a sharp sensor to feel it. And that all happens on the first night of Ramadan. I'm asking you a question. By the first night of Ramadan, has a single Muslim fasted yet? I'm going to repeat in my question. By the first night of Ramadan, has a single Muslim fasted Ramadan yet? That has nothing to do with your ibadah. It has nothing to do with the ibadah of 1.5 billion people. It is, has to do with Allah, Allah's generosity, Allah's mercy, and Allah giving you a gift with before before you ever even start fulfilling one of the pillars of Islam and before you start offering your ibadah. Already the action started in the unseen world. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in another hadith, in this, in this hadith actually, all the gates of heaven open until no gate is closed, all the gates of hell close until no gate is open. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and then Allah chains the shayateen. And then Allah sends angels to call. Public announcement. Ya baghi al-khayri aqbil. 
وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرِّ أَقْصِرْ O oh, you who want to do something good, come forward. Come. This is your time. Angels are calling. But who's listening? Someone with a sharp sensor. يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ أَقْبِلْ وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرْ And O oh, you who want to do evil, go back. This is not your time. For you to have a sharp sensor, you need to start fasting and preparing yourself in Sha'ban. What the Sha'ban fasting in Sha'ban does? It sharpens your sensors. So you start feeling. Maybe you're not hearing the call exactly of the angel, but you're feeling it. You understand? Because you've sharpened your sensors. You remove the dust from that golden sensor that Allah gave you that you call your ruh. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, and Allah releases and pardons certain number of souls from hell. Their name is written off from hell. They will not go to hell. Do we know who are these names? Do we know who are these names? That Allah writes off from hell. That they're not going to hell for sure. Do we know them? Does Allah share them with us? <clears throat> I'll tell you a secret again how Rasulullah interacts with this deen and his interaction becomes a sunnah, a revelation. Rasulullah was asked, Ya Rasulullah, why do you fast on Mondays and Thursdays? He said, because those days, the deeds, the files, the records of the ibad are offered to Allah Azza wa Jal. So, when my book of deed, when my report for the number of days from Thursday to Monday, right? By the time my book of deed is lifted up to Allah, I want when Allah looks at my book of deeds, He looks at me and He sees me fasting. So Allah pardons and forgives the mishabits and mistakes in this book of deeds. You understand? And from Monday to Thursday, it's reported on Thursday. From Thursday to Monday, it's reported on Monday. So, when your book of deeds for the whole year becomes reported to Allah Azza wa Jal, and Allah looks at you on your fasting, Allah forgives you and pardons you. Imagine the possibility. Our entire life, we work so hard to gain this one goal. And this one goal is offered. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specified the timing. They said, when Ya Rasulullah, when every day Allah pardons names from hell? He says, yes. He said, when? He said, every night. Every? Then Rasulullah in another hadith. He says, there is a night in Ramadan that Allah forgives all the believers, all of those who fasted and did their best, Allah forgives them. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we know. It's Laylatul Qadr. He said, no. They said, which, ay, when, which night, Ya Rasulullah? He said, it's the last night of Ramadan. And then he looked at them and he said, when does a person get paid except at the end of his job? Are you with me? Are you paying attention? First night, so much action on the unseen. Last night is the big prize. Every night is prizes are distributed to the ibad. And all of this happening at night. And it has nothing to do with what you're doing because you're fasting in the day, not in the night. The month of Ramadan, I find in the books of hadith, a hadith that are weak. But it's okay to use these weak hadith in such matters, we're not establishing a new system of belief or a new hukum or a new ruling in fiqh. So from the days of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the Hanbalis always use the weak hadith. There is a difference between weak hadith and fabricated hadith. Fabricated hadith, you cannot use it at all. Weak, the ulama said our judgment of it, it's weak. But sometimes they say this is a weak hadith, but its meaning is sahih because it's mentioned in another hadith that is sahih in another. This meaning is 
is acceptable. We don't see anything wrong with it. So the meaning is okay, but the hadith, our judgment of it, of the chain of narrators that it is weak. It has some weakness in it. So Imam Ahmed Muhammad, in his mind, he said, I'd rather take a weak hadith than make ishtihad myself, make up my opinion. I'd rather make, follow a weak hadith than make it. Fine. So we'll take this hadith by. Are you ready for this? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Allah revealed Suhuf Ibrahim on the first night of Ramadan. And he revealed the Torah to Musa on the seventh night of Ramadan. And he revealed the Injil to Isa on the fourteenth night of Ramadan. And he revealed the Zabur to Dawood on the 29th of Ramadan. And he revealed the Quran on the 25th night of Ramadan. Hadith. Do you know what that says to us? Ramadan is anciently a blessed Mubarak month from long time ago. Because I want you to think with me. What is fasting? The technical fasting is not eating from dawn to sunset. True or false? True. Fasting, not eating from dawn to sunset. I'm asking you a question. If to fulfill the ibadah of fasting, can't we fast? Just hypothetically, can't we fast in the month of Shaban? Because it's from dawn to sunset. Is there a dawn and a sunset in the month of Shaban or there is no? How about the month of Rajab? How about the month of Shawwal? There is no lack of dawn and sunset in any of these months. But what you want to know is Allah for our Ummah did something very, 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 very special. Allah has chosen something for us that put us ahead of everyone else. We are the envy of all other nations. Because he sent for us Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he sent for us the final message, Al-Quran Al-Kareem. Before, because he made us fast in the month of Ramadan. Because this is what's happening. The month of Ramadan, you come to it from the first night to the last night to every night. And did I forget to talk about the last 10 nights of Ramadan or did I not? I did. Do you want me to remind you of the last 10 nights of Ramadan? Do you want me to remind you of the last 10 no, five odd nights of the ten na- odd nights of Ramadan. You already have heard tons of hadith about this, right? And what is it talking? Night or day? Night. And you're not fasting in the night. So the month of Ramadan, anciently, in Allah's knowledge, is a blessed month, independent of anyone's action, or ibadah, or worship. And in this month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has taken this pillar of Islam, fasting. Fasting. Allah Azza wa Jal took this fasting that could have happened in any month, skipped Shawwal, Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram, Safar, Rabi'ul Awwal, Rabi'ul Thani, Jumad al Ula, Jumad al Thaniya, Rajab, Sha'ban, and then came into Ramadan and dropped fasting in the day. So now what do you have? You have a 24-hour, 24-7 action. You are in a washing machine that does not stop washing 24-7. You understand? We could have fasted any day. And here is where Muslims lose it. Because they're not paying attention to their own book. They fast in the day, and once they break their fast, oh, alhamdulillah, khalas, we broke our fast. Yalla, where is the games? Yalla, bring the games. What TV shows? What, what games are we showing? Yalla, let's invite. Come here, man. Let's go and watch a movie. Let's go and hang out. Wallah, khala, alhamdulillah. We, ya habibi, ya nur aini. You are missing the whole. It's like someone ran a long marathon, and when he reached the finish line, he's on the first. 
He looked around and said, hey guys, how are you doing? And he walked sideways and didn't finish the finish line. You understanding? This is what happens when you don't know your deen. And when you don't, you read your book and when you don't, you read the hadith of your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. People run a marathon, long days and all, 18 hours of fasting, 16. You remember last year? Right? By Salat al Dhuhr, you're thinking, when is Maghrib, right? It's already like eight hours past, like what is it? From 5, 4.45 or something, you're you 12 o'clock, you said, only Dhuhr? And you're running this whole marathon, running, 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 you break your fast, and then you exit. And the whole point of you running the whole marathon is to get into the finish line and to receive the trophy. The trophy is distributed at night, not in the day. The trophy is distributed at night, not in the day. So, <clears throat> for you, for you, to be able to capture the blessings of the night, to be one of these names that will be written off hell, to be one of these names that are now honorable in the eyes of Allah, to reach your goal, the reason why you are alive altogether, the whole day you have this sponge of fasting and you're washing and washing and washing and washing the whole day. Salah, reading Quran, istighfar, dua, dhikr. You're washing, you're washing, you're washing. So at the end of the day, you're sitting and you're like, Ya Allah, am I qualified to receive the blessing now? Can you please look at me? Can you, am I clean? Do I deserve? Can I be one of these names? Can you like, please, Ya Allah. So the Prophet Sallallahu is saying, show Allah of yourself goodness in this month. Show off. Yani show off. The whole day you're working hard, and now at night, you work hard harder you go make your iftar make sure you eat nurture the body the prophet وسلم, especially in ramadan he used to break his fast with water milk and sometimes soup whatever liquid 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 so that you nurture the body because fasting is not meant to kill you or harm you it's meant to nurture you so you eat and now you're going to taraweeh wallahi brothers and sisters if it's up to me in my human intelligence. And if this deen was designed by a human, I will prescribe Salat al-Taraweeh for people while they're fasting. And you're fasting. You know when you're fasting, why don't you double up? Why don't we fast? And after Asr we pray Taraweeh. Wow, that sounds impressive, right? But that's what the human thinks. But what you're not realizing, brothers and sisters, this is what's happening. Allah Azza wa Jal tells you this Quran came from al al Mahfud, the sacred tablets, sacred protected tablets. Basically, Allah is using a word to bring to your understanding that this is the exclusive knowledge of Allah that Allah doesn't even show to angels. Until He wills to show it to angels, then the changes became, become. And not all angels. Ilm al ghayb is with Allah Azza wa Jal. When Allah wills to show to show, he will show. When Allah sh wills to show it to a human, He will show it to a human, like the prophets and the messengers. Sometimes Allah show it to you in your dreams. The Quran was unknown to Jibril alayhi salam. Jibril, the one who brings all the books, and the, he doesn't know it. So Allah Azza wa Jal revealed it from al lawh al mahfuz to the sky of this world. Imagine how many light years is that unmeasured distance that's something from outside of our universe from outside of this bubble that we call time and space comes something then travels through time and space and comes and Allah says when I revealed it I revealed it you know the surah come on inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr and if you like passed by this like your laylat yeah 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 yeah, let me maybe day or night. And Allah, Allah says, hold on. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ So maybe you're still not getting it, right? So he hits you third time with it. لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ Take a thousand months. And خَيْرٌ It's not equal to. You know the bigger than sign in math? لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ 
من ألف شهر better than a, not equal take that ألف شهر I took that ألف شهر ألف شهر how many months in the year 12 take your phone you take a thousand divided on 12 83.33333 years one night what you can accomplish in it is better than 83 years what is an 83 years the maximum average potential of you living on this planet yani allah saying one night do you get what's happening yani islam is full of opportunities it's full of just make it man just just try just try try i'm going to throw at you laylatul qadr not once in a lifetime every year i'm going to throw but what happens if you're ready and Allah throws at you Laylatul Qadr and you receive it and you witness it and it's written for you. Now you're going to meet Allah Azza wa Jal with a worship of, let's say you lived 85 years, مثلاً, 90 years, 100 years. You're going to meet Allah with 100 years. Whatever worship you did in this 100 years, which is not much by the way, plus 83 years. So as if you lived your life twice. What happened if you witness Laylatul Qadr twice? You've lived 85 years, 95 years, and you witness Laylatul Qadr in your entire life. You fasted 50 Ramadan, but you witness Laylatul Qadr only twice. You're meeting Allah with 95 years of ibadah, which is not much, plus 83 plus, because khayrun, khayrun, better than, is a plus. So it's not equal. So 83 plus. So you're meeting Allah with 95 years of life plus 83 plus plus 83 plus. Because other than that, we're doomed. You realize. Let's say average life of a human. The Prophet ﷺ said, my life is, average ummah of my life, 60s to 70s. And he died at 63. 60 years, and if you lived on average from birth to death with the variation for eight hours a night, you've slept 20 years out of the 60 years. True or false? Mathematics. Eight hours is one third of 24. 20 years is one third of. If you worked and went to school from birth to death, average eight hours, there goes another 20 years. If you sat down and ate breakfast and lunch and dinner, drove to work and drove back four years there goes another 10 years mashallah you are namazi hijabi amazing you prayed five times a day allah akbar how long does it take you to pray five times five 25 minutes half an hour times 60 years you're barely meeting allah with a year and a half of worship out of 60 years that's a problem that needs fixing so Rasulullah showed us how to fix the problem before you go to sleep you make dua you intend your sleep for Allah there goes eight hours added to the worship you wake up from sleep, you make dua to Allah. Alhamdulillah, ladhi ahyana ba'da ma amatana wa ilayhi al-nushur. Bismillahi, tawakkalna ala Allah, wa la hawla, wa la quwata illa billah. Asbahna wa asbah al-mulku li. You go make wudu, salah. The eight hours of work added to your worship. You sit down, you put the food, just take one second. Bismillah. Allahumma barik lana. Ya Allah, bless this food that you've given us. Because what kills us, what gives us sick? The food that you eat. So you're saying, Ya Allah, Make this food blessing and take the sickness away from it. That's what means Allahumma barik. Take the sickness and put the blessing. Yani this poor person, I was paying attention like, why Allahumma barik lana fi ma razaqtana? And it occurred to me, a billion people out of one billion to two billion people are under poverty line in the world. All what they can afford is a piece of bread. Tayyib, where is the mineral? and the proteins, and the vitamins, and the fatty acids, and the fats. Oh, they tell you, you have to have these, all of this. You got nothing but a dry piece of bread, yani, pure, dead carbohydrates. <laughs> and you're going to eat it. And that's all what you can afford. 
You say, Allahumma barik lana fi ma razaqtana. I say, Allah, your rizq to me is this piece of bread. I'm not going to be unhappy with you. Just bless it. Bismillah. And you eat. Allah puts the minerals and the proteins and the fats and the vitamins. And you live your life. And you're eating bread. And you're healthier than <laughs> Layla that lives in Santa Clara and, you know, and Fatima that lives in New York and, and, the, and the Layla and Fatima that lives in Africa she's eating a piece of, and she's healthier than both of them what's happening? Allahumma barik lana fi ma razaqtana the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam يعني, milk and dates for days, for months how is he surviving? so now we come back this Layla to Qadr Allah says inna anzalnahu في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ليلة القدر يعني three nights so that you would wake up <gasps> it was at night do you understand my dear brothers and sisters what is صلاة التراويح صلاة التراويح is you going through the mood that Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم went through of being at night receiving the revelation from Allah except in your case it's the Qari not Jibreel what is the exercise of Salat al-Taraweeh? do you know what's the exercise? and people start arguing is Taraweeh fard or not? لا يحب. Alhamdulillah it's not fard what do you want? Alhamdulillah the Prophet didn't make it fard is Taraweeh this or just go and listen to the Quran do you know what ladies in Palestine used to do? In Al Masjid Al Aqsa and in Medina Al Khalil and this, they used to go pray inside the Masjid the month. When they get their monthly period for a week, they will come to the Masjid and sit around the Masjid to listen to the Imam reciting. They will not miss it. So that, do you know why? Because there was no tapes. The only chance that they had to hear the Quran from beginning to end is when the Qari reads it in Ramadan. So they're not going to miss that. So they hear the Quran whether they're on their period or not in their period. They're smart. They found a solution. Either inside the masjid or outside the masjid. But they're listening. They're not going to miss it. They're not going to miss it. So do you know what's the exercise of Salat al-Taraweeh? You're literally listening. Did Jibreel alayhi salam come on Laylat al-Qadr and say, I have a tablet with me. Iqra ya Muhammad. Read this. Did he do that? How did Rasulullah receive the first revelation and every revelation? How? Jibreel recites and he listens. And you know what you do in Ramadan? You go to the masjid, the imam is reciting and you are listening. And you're doing it at night, exactly when the Quran was revealed, at night. And you're going through the exercise of receiving the revelation from Allah through the Qari to you, from Allah to Jibreel, Jibreel to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from Muhammad to Sahaba, Tabi'in, 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 Qari to Qari to Qari to your Qari, that I should have served him the tea instead of him serving me the tea? To what? To your ears. A connected chain of narrators from Rabbul Izzah, Jalla Jalaluhu to you throughout history and time. So you're not any less than the believers who lived around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. So, brothers and sisters, understanding that will help you understand the value of the month of Ramadan. This is a month of worship, a month of ibadah, a month of receiving the revelation. Except you're not the prophet or the messenger, but you're walking in the footsteps of the prophet and the messenger. And nights, anyway, throughout the year, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah Azza wa Jal descends upon this worldly sky in the last one third of the night. And Allah asks, Is there anyone who needs something that I will give it to him? Is there anyone who's seeking protection from something? Something is scaring you, bothering you, you want protection so that I can protect him. Is there anyone that wants to talk to me so that I will talk to him? 
And that's the last one third of the night. That's year round. Now imagine in the nights of the month of Ramadan. You understand? I was reflecting upon that and I realized, you know, <laughs> when we get out, when we get out of planet Earth, do you know there is nothing but night out there? The default state between the galaxies and all of this and this is what? Is darkness. The, the scientists came back to us and said, sorry, sorry, sorry. What happened, scientists? We misinformed you. How? We told you that the world is made of atoms. And atoms are made of nucleon, you know, nucleus, and the nucleus has protons and protons and then electrons outside. And but we found out that that's not true. So what is true? We missed the truth by some 96%. What are you talking about? Only 4% of the universe is made of atoms. And 96% is made of dark matter and dark energy that we have no clue what it is. It's not made of atoms. And then they come and say, oh, no, no, there is no God. <laughs> and we're very sure of it. Habibi, in 20 years you change your mind 96% and you want me to trust you and believe you? 96% you missed the truth. The world is made of atoms. The world has been always there. So there is no beginning and end, therefore there is no God. Oops, sorry. We detected the microwave radiation and actually the world has a beginning. And it started from a very small point and then it exploded. And we think it's going to have an end. Sorry. You understand? And they keep on fooling us like that. But we say, huh? we say, okay, if it's dark matter and dark energy, how do you know that it exists? They say we see its effect on the world. We see its effect on the world. We see that dark matter and dark energy, its effect on the galaxies pushing the galaxies away from each other. So you say you believe that there is something called dark matter and dark energy that you haven't seen, you've just seen its effect on the seen world. They say yes. We say now you're talking like us, Mashaikh, and people of religion. Why? Because we say we haven't seen Allah or angels, but we see Allah's effect and angels and the unseen world effect on the existing world. And you used to make fun of us when we used to say that. Now you're talking like us. So be aware and be smart and learn. Because knowledge opens your eyes. So Allah Azza wa is telling us, Inna anzalnahu. So brothers and sisters, just to throw something, the Quran, Allah did not say worship numbers. So we don't worship numbers, we worship Allah. We don't put number one in front of us and we start worshipping it. We what? We worship Allah. But just a gift for you like this. This is what's called a contemplation. It's not the truth, what I'm telling you. It's just contemplation. How many letters in the word Layla? Lam, Ya, Lam, Ha. Lay, La. Four. How many letters in the word Al-Qadr? Now the one who said five is scared is saying four. It doesn't have to be the same answer every time. Alif, Lam, Qa, Da, Ra, Al-Qadr. So there is an expression called Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr is an expression, phrase. Layla is four plus five equals times three. Oh, what did you say? Just a thought, just for, just for thought. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. This laylatul qadr, the surah al qadr is made of what? 30 words. How many words? 30 words. This surah was revealed early in Mecca, very early years in Mecca. The Quran ended up how many juzo? 30 juzo. It's okay. But what if I tell you that inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr from inna alif inna anzal salamun hiya hatta matla al fajr ra? What if I tell you that it is exactly 114 letters? 
exactly the number of surahs in the Quran. طيب. إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر حتى مطلع الفجر word هي it means it سلام peaceful it is it this what is it ليلة القدر this letter, this word here, which means it is, is word number 27. Just what? Remember, we don't worship numbers, you understand? Just what? This is what we call the icing on the cake and the cherry on top. Just something for you to think about. Something very interesting. Okay. So, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with this month and he has kept it as a gift for us. There's something Ibrahim alayhi salam and his grandson Yaqub alayhi salam said to their children, said to their children when they were on their deathbed and Allah mentioned that. Bismillah rahim I'm trying to remember the beginning. Ya bani, inna Allah astafa lakum al-deena. Wawassa biha Ibrahim banihi wa Ya'qub. Ibrahim has told his children before he died, and Ya'qub told his children, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. What did they tell their children? What did they tell them? They told them, hold on to your faith. But this is what they told them. Ya Baniya, O oh my children, Inna Allah astafa lakum ud-deena. Allah has chosen for you this deen. I'm going to ask you a question. Your loved one goes to the flower shop, spends half an hour, checks every flower, and then he goes and picks a flower. And then he comes to you and said, I have chosen you for you. I have chosen for you this flower from a whole field and a whole flower shop that is so huge and big, I felt that this is the most beautiful flower, and I give it to you. Do you understand? You know what Allah said in the Quran? Ibrahim and Yaqub, they told their children, Oh my children, Allah has chosen for you this faith. And one of the ways that Allah has chosen this faith is this month of Ramadan. For Allah to keep it as a secret, for Allah to keep it as a hidden jewel, until he exposed it to the Ummah of the Prophet وسلم, is something really fascinating. So, brothers and sisters, I want you to, like, the Prophet وسلم, this chosen month of Ramadan for you, he says, my Ummah was given five things in Ramadan. No other Ummah was given these five things. One, the smell of hunger that comes out of the mouth of the believer because he's fasting is more beloved to Allah than the smell of musk. Please, brothers and sisters, differentiate between a bad mouth smell and the smell of hunger. Because Rasulullah used to use what? Smiswak, to kill the bad mouth smell. But what you cannot kill is the smell of hunger. And the smell of hunger, it depends from one person to another, but in general, it's well known, defined, like when you talk to someone and they're hungry, they haven't eaten, there's a certain smell. We don't like it. We try to hide it. We take a gum or something else. What happened when Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam took a gum? But it wasn't a gum because there was no gum. He took a leaf from the tree after fasting for 30 days. And he because the time of him talking to Allah came. Allah gave him 30 days of appointment. At the end of the 30 days, he's like, my God, this is embarrassing. My mouth smells like from hunger. He went to a tree and he chewed the leaves. So, because now he's about to speak to Allah. You know, look how the adab of Sayyidina Musa, he doesn't want to talk to Allah with a bad mouth smell. 
So Allah said to Musa, why did you do that? He said, Ya Allah, I was embarrassed of you to speak to you with my mouth. Allah told Musa, Ya Musa, don't you know that that smell that comes out of a hunger, a hunger that came out of devotion and dedication and love to me is more beloved to me than the smell of musk. I'm explaining the hadith to you, so I'm inserting words. Don't you know that the smell that comes out of what? Of the mouth of the hungry person is more beloved. Why is it more beloved than the smell of musk? Because the hunger came out of a dedication and devotion to Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's why from this hadith, I deduced that do not say I'm fasting so that I can lose weight. You ruin this for yourself. Because now you're doing shirk, you're fasting for Allah, and you're fasting to lose weight, and you're fasting for yourself. You, if you fast right, like the Prophet Sallallahu used to fast, which is fast in the day, drink a lot of water, a lot of milk, and a lot of soup at night, I guarantee you, you will lose weight in Ramadan. It's given to you without you focusing on it. But to say that my intention is to lose weight and to fast, you ruined it. Because that hunger comes from a dedication and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need what? We need that dedication and devotion to be pure, ikhlas, remember? To whom we're doing it? To qul huwa Allahu, to the one and only, the one and unique. You're with me. You're understanding what we're talking about here. So don't ruin it. Use miswak, but that hunger. So imagine that hunger smell makes you closer to Allah. Ajib, huh? So fasting pays off. It gets you closer. Allah loves you. To Allah now, you are like you opened. You know the atr? When you open it, the smell is everywhere. Now to Allah, you are a bottle of atr. And the smell coming out of you in the unseen world is making everything beautiful. Number two, in this month, Allah makes angels make istighfar to them. So angels, thousands upon them. When Rasulullah visited the Bayt al-Ma'mur in al-Isra al miraj he said, I saw al Bayt al-Ma'mur, it's the Kaaba of the Malaika in sky, centered above our Kaaba. And Rasulullah said, I saw 70,000 angels make hajj to that house every day, and they never ever go back again. So how many 70,000 angels did Allah create? Only Allah knows. Allah makes the angels make istighfar to you. Ya Allah, ighfir li Muhammad. Ya Allah, ighfir li Ali. Ya Allah, ighfir li Fatima. Ya Allah, ighfir li Sayyida. Ya Allah, ighfir li... You know, you understand. The angels are working for you, making istighfar for you. Because Allah is telling them, you don't get hungry. They do, and they're getting hungry for my sake. So make istighfar to them. You know, you know when you see someone righteous, you say, please make dua for me. I'm going to ask you, if you see an angel, what are you going to say? They're already doing that in the month of Ramadan. وَيُزَيِّنُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ جَنَّتَهُ And Allah every day decorates His Jannah. And He tells the Jannah, very soon, my devotees will come to you. Very soon, they will shed off the burdens of life and the bothers and, and the worries and the stress and depression and this. Very soon, they will what? Put it off and come and enjoy you. Do you know why people don't get bored in Jannah? If you go to a place, very beautiful, on the lake, you buy a house. What happens after 10 years? What happens after one year? You're not even looking out of the window. You've seen this lake until now it's like printed in your memory. It's no more. Now when you go to the desert, you're like, wow, this is beautiful. And the guy in the desert is like, can you show me a house? Oh my God, you're living in a Jannah. And you're like, yeah, man, mosquitoes. Smell when it dries up in the summer. This is beautiful, look. Everything is clean. Everything, oh, no bacteria survives here from the heat. So now, do you know why people don't get bored in Jannah for infinity? Because every day, Allah puts it in a new shape. Every day, it's a new view. And Allah Azza wa Jal, in the month of Ramadan, 
uses his creativity and Allah calls himself creative, right? He's the creator, so he's creative, صح? Every day he puts new possibilities of joy in Jannah so that when you go to it, you will never be bored. When does that happen? In the month of Ramadan. <coughs> And the, cha- and the shayateen become chained in that month. That's another thing. So that the shaytan... By the way, people get overwhelmed. Oh my God, I have shaytan. And my shaytan is inspiring evil to me. And this and this and that. Okay, hold on. Let's hold on. Number one. You have two angels go with you wherever you go. And they are angels. They are what? Doesn't matter they're writing good deeds and bad deeds. They are what? So you have two angels with you going... Another angel that Rasulullah Sallallahu said that Allah dedicates for every person an angel to inspire him to do good. But people don't talk about that. So you don't know it. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said when you see an inclination like inside you like a, an idea comes out evil know that that's shaitan. And if you see something today like just let's do this like someone is talking to you that's an angel that Allah put to inspire you to do good. So now we have two, one the right, one the left, and the third one is doing what? Every time the shaitan inspires you to do evil, he comes and counters his argument. Then there is angels that Allah put them to protect you, around you, just protection. Then there are angels that carry your dua to Allah, and there are special angels that carry your salah and salam to the Prophet ﷺ, and they bring the answer back. Yani, I feel sorry for that one shaitan. He's surrounded by so many angels, he doesn't know what to do. I feel like, like his whole life is like waiting, waiting, waiting. He goes and whispers to you one second and he runs away like, oh, that was too many angels for me. This is his whole life. And then when he gets close to you and you feel there's something not wrong, you're getting angry out of order. Something is not, something is this. So you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the, my ibad, when shaitan comes and take over, they remember, so they mention my name, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Now the shaitan is running very far from you. Your worry, you know people, we have become consumed by talking about shaitan and sihr and nazar and jinn position. That's question number one. As if our deen did not come to liberate us from that. Yani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who nothing can harm him without Allah's permission. Yani Allah made him go through a human experience that otherwise he wouldn't go through it. What was the human experience that he went through? Someone did sihr to him. You know when Allah made him go through that just so that he's an example for you and I. Like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi one day prayed salat al-dhuhr two rak'ah. Sayyid salam alayhi salam alaykum. The sahaba ya Rasulullah, did salat change? He said no. Did it change from four to two? He said, no. They said, Ya Rasulullah, you prayed two rak'ah. He said, I prayed four. They said, you prayed two, Ya Rasulullah. He said, I did. They said, yes. He said, okay. He got up, prayed another two rak'ah, finished the salah, made sujood as sahu Salaamu alaykum, salamu alaykum. And now we learned what happened when we forget in salah. Allah made him forget so that he can be an example for you. Allah made the Prophet go through the experience of sihr. And then he told him, you don't have to worry. You and your ummah, I just made you go through this experience just so that you know what to do. Just read, قُلْ وَاللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْنَّاسِ In the morning, in the evening, three times, three times, three times, and ayatul kursi one time, and no shaitan, no sihr, anything that is harming you will dissolve. Have zero effect on you. خلاص, we're liberated. Now we can think about other things. What's the entire Muslim world is consumed in? Every Muslim country, sihr, sihr, sihr. Sihr. You know people believe in sihr more than they believe in Allah? And they believe in the power of sihr more than they believe in the power of Allah. And they fear the power of sihr more than they fear Allah. Shirk or not shirk? Wallahi, that's shirk. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be this scared. So in Ramadan, what does Allah do? He chains the shayateen for you. That's number four. And the Prophet said, and number five, he forgives them in the last night of Ramadan because that's when they're done with their ibadah. The next day is the last day of Ramadan and Allah Jalla Jalaluhu forgives them. So all what we have done today is cover the first subject and this is the end of it.
And then now we move to another subject from Ramadan to talking about the Quran. But I don't believe we have time for that. I want to leave a time for question and answer for you. So please, you know, inshallah, if you can, if you want to ask questions, ask questions. And inshallah, you can maybe watch the rest on this. But um, there's no way for me to summarize another f three out of four so that you can have a full picture of Ramadan. This is just talking about the month of Ramadan, independent of any fasting. Month of Ramadan is a blessed month every night. And that's why you fast in the day so that you can be ready to receive the blessings of the night. That's why you fast in the day. So Allah matched a very special month with a very special ibadah. Very special month with very special ibadah. Fasting with Ramadan. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا الْحَمْدُ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Any questions? The Prophet ﷺ, يعني may Allah accept from your grandfather and grandmother, inshaAllah. The Prophet ﷺ forbid the Muslims from fasting on the day of Eid. He told them, you shall not fast. This is Allah's gift to you, so accept his gift. The Prophet ﷺ, when a man told him, I want to fast every day, he said, the most that you should do is fast one day and break the fast the next day, fast one day and break. And that's the best siyam, the siyam of my brother Dawood alayhi salam. Because Dawood alayhi salam used to do that. By the way, fasting is recorded and very clear in the Bible for the Jews and the Christians. It's just we chose to carry the command and keep it. And someone else chose to interpret it and not do it. That's not our problem. That's their problem and that's their interpretation. But fasting is mentioned also in the Bible. That's why when Allah said, I've written up it upon you like I written up on those who came before you, just so that you know that it's not you're not the only one who were fasting. Even Musa alayhi salam was fasting, right? Way before, right? And fasted for thirty nights, then he fasted for another ten nights. So now we have thirty plus ten equals forty. And it was fasting. The Prophet ﷺ explained that to us. Next question. Yes. At what age do you have to start to fast? In general, the age that you reach puberty. The beginning of your puberty, you start fasting. But if the person reaches puberty and his body or her body is very weak, then they wait until their body becomes strong. But when? If they do not reach puberty and they reach the age 15, so in both cases, by age 15, most of the fuqaha has chosen age 15 to be the age that the person has to fast. But that's provided that they did not reach puberty up to age 15 or they've reached puberty with a very weak body that if they fast, they will die. So you don't let them fast, obviously. Next. And once you open the, the books of fiqh, every madhab says a different thing. So we say at the end, Allahu A'lam. But that is the average between all of them. <coughs> Next. Yes, sister, I'm sorry. Yes. May Allah bless you. If you cannot make it to the masjid and pray tarawih, then pray tarawih at your home. Let me tell you what our mother Aisha and the other ladies in Medina used to do for Abdullah ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Abbas used to be a kid, but he used to memorize a lot of Quran. So they used to make halwa. You know halwa? And they say, if you lead us in tarawih, we will give you halwa. And he used to lead them in tarawih at their homes when they couldn't go and make it to the masjid. And they used to give him halwa at the end. He's happy and they are happy. So which tells us that also what you said, what people don't realize, it's a separate ibadah to listen to Quran other than reading Quran. Reading Quran is a ibadah. Listening to Quran is another ibadah. Allah told us, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا 
لعلكم ترحمون. When the Quran is recited, listen to it. Get into the revelation mode. Listen to it. وأنصتوا and settle down. Give it its due respect. I don't like the Quran to be a background. You're working and talking and this and this. We just want the Quran to be blessing for the home and the Quran is running in the background and everyone is talking. When the Quran is recited, you sit down. Do all of your housework, but then sit down. The other advice I really have for all of you. You have a ibadah of coming and listening to the Quran at night from the Qari in Taraweeh or at home. But add to that. Listen to that juzu recited in Arabic, then the translation in English. Recited in Arabic, then the translation in Urdu. Recited in Arabic, then the translation in Persian. So that you understand what Allah is saying to you. So now you're getting both. One, you're listening to the word of Allah. Good, done. Two, you understand what's recited. And when you understand, you're going to pick this and pick that and pick this and pick that until you what? Until it hits you and you have understood something. Brothers and sisters, the Quran is not to be sung. Yani it's not a song only for people to sing it. Oh, this Qari beautiful, that Qari beautiful, this Qari make us cry. This it's a book that Allah said. Why are they not contemplating their meanings? Why are they not contemplating its meanings? Yani the Quran meeting. Or are their hearts have locks on it? So in other words, if you're not understanding and contemplating, there is a lock on your heart. Unlock it, take it, throw it out in the garbage, and get yourself into the habit of listening and understanding, and then try your best to implement. Once you do these three things, listen, read or listen, hmm? but especially read, understand and implement, the Prophet ﷺ tells you, with every harf, you get ten hasana. With every harf, you get ten hasana. So that's because you put the effort in listening, reading, understanding, and implementing. Otherwise, we're fooling ourselves by just saying, oh, I read the entire Quran. Did you pick one thing? No. Did you decide to change one thing? No. <laughs> Come on. It's going to get better than that. So... Read, listen, understand, and implement. And walk away with Ramadan with one change. So that Allah will bless you and bless your change, inshaAllah. Last. Ramad in Arabic is when your mouth becomes dry from thirst. You know when your tongue becomes stuck because there's no... One of the meanings of that is Ramad, right? And there is a, a disagreement between the linguistics. But you have to know something. There is a problem with all of that. Reason is the Arabic months are lunar months. And lunar months are not attached to season. So you're going to have a Ramadan that your mouth become dry. And you're going to have a Ramadan that your mouth is never dry. And when the time of iftar comes at 4.30, 4.45, you feel like I didn't fast. I'm not even hungry. Still, my, the food of suhoor is still in my stomach. You understand? So, to say that Ramadan is only in the summer, that is a problem with that. But maybe to say it means thirst, maybe there is better. Yeah, you get thirsty, you know. Allahu alam. But it's the name of a month. No. There's a lot of benefits in fasting, definitely. Health benefits. They used to ostracize us and make fun of us for fasting. Then they started doing fasting. And they called it intermittent fasting. And they call it wet fasting with water. Then now the latest craze and phenomena in the world of diets is dry fasting. And what's dry fasting? No eating, no drinking. Because they found out that it resets every cell in the body. And every cell gets rid of the DNA that's full of the cancer stuff. So it's a blessing from Allah Azza wa definitely. But we don't fast for that for the medical health because Allah said when you're sick break your fast he didn't say when you're sick fast so we just want to be careful how much we run with that stuff we want our base to be the revelation and then if anything benefit comes ahlan wa sahlan welcome 
جزاكم الله خير لسريد سورة العصر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه